Hi, you're 13. Welcome to this um, lecture uh, on the traditional Marxist approach to crime and deviance. Um, so, first of all, I'd like you to start off by looking at this quote from Angela Davies, who was um, a leader of the Black Panthers, who we, we will be looking at in other, subject, other su subjects. Um, she said uh, that the real criminals in our society are not the people who populate our prisons, but those people who have stolen the wealth of the world from the people. And uh, can you annotate on your PowerPoint what you actually think she meant by this? And perhaps you could go back to this quote after we finish the lecture and add in what you then understand what she meant by this. Um, see if you can think of an example. Like, what does she mean, the wealth of the world? Okay, and who, who, who are those people who have done that? Stolen the wealth of the world. Um, so here you've got um, a couple of examples of um, crimes that have been dealt with by agents of social control. So can you please um, add to your PowerPoint, uh, how are these different crimes being dealt with by the agents of social control? Like which, which agents of social control are involved in, in these two crimes? Um, single mum, jail for benefit fraud, after swimming the state out of more than £50,000, uh, she's sentenced to two years in jail, and just to be clear, that's a, that's a headline from a newspaper. Uh, Magul accountant sentenced for um, £640,000 in tax fraud, also sentenced to two years in jail. Um, so what do you think about the nature of those two punishments? And um, again, can you identify which agents of social control are involved? Um, I know in your PowerPoint I've asked you to work out how much benefit fraud actually costs the economy a year, um, and underneath that, you've got a few boxes talking about what we'd call, um, I guess, white-collar crime. So in total, what does white-collar crime actually uh, cost our economy per year? And if you have a quick look at that pie chart, I'm sure you can identify the point I'm getting at is that we know far more about benefit fraud, and it's in the news far more, and we feel more angry, possibly, about benefit fraud because of the media and the agents of um, um, ideological control. Um, when actually the, the real cost to us and our economy and our country is possibly coming from these sort of middle class criminals who are, who are conducting the, these sorts of affairs behind closed doors and not often being arrested for it. So Marxists argue that we can actually blame crime and deviance on the structure of the capitalist society and there are three particular strands to this. The first one is um, the way that uh, we, we suffer ideological control through the manipulation of values. And this essentially ensures support for the ruling class. Um, uh, we're then going to have a look at the state and lawmaking itself. So within that, we're going to look at law creation and uh, how this reflects the interest of the ruling class and also law enforcement and how that's applied differently to different social groups. And finally, we're going to look at criminogenic capitalism, um, which kind of links in with the individual motivation. So yes, there might be structures at work that cause crime, but we're also going to have a look at how, how individuals choose to act criminally in response to capitalism. So first of all, we're going to have a look at the manipulation of values. Now this links very closely to the work of Louis Althusser, who you've already looked at. I'm sorry the formatting's gone a bit funny. Um, uh, so we can use many of his ideas here. So he argued that the ruling class basically controls us through two ways. The first one is through um, ideological control, uh, through processes like socialisation, and the second is sort of the repressive state apparatus, which we're going to talk about in a second. So through socialisation, um, people are persuaded into the rightness of capitalism by agencies such as schools and the mass media. Um, so certain capitalist values are taught at, at schools and through the media, such as meritocracy, the idea that you, know, you should work hard and be rewarded, which means that when people don't work hard and get rewarded, that really flies in the face of our ideas about what's right. Um, we're very much pushed into the idea of individual, individual success for the individual. Um, things like respecting private property, desiring private property, and um, hierarchy, and, and a range of other values that lead us to think that actually capitalism is right, it is fair, you know, it's, it rewards hard work, you know, what could possibly be wrong with capitalism? Um, as well as manipulating our values about capitalism being good and fair, aka the false class consciousness, um, the values that we, we, we sort of learn to accept also determine our ideas about what counts as a crime. So, for example, can you please think, how could causing someone's death be criminal for some people and not others in a capitalist society? So, 
For example, if, um, if somebody uh, shot someone um, in, I don't know, a supermarket, that would be criminal. But can you think of any groups in our society that actually can kill and do kill, and that isn't often considered criminal? Um, and for example, why is exploitation of workers not considered criminal? Um, so if some people, many people in the UK die every year because of stress related to work pressure and financial pressure. So why isn't that considered criminal if people are effectively being killed by the exploitation in the workplace? And this is happening in the, in the UK, not just in the third world, although that is something we should also consider. Uh, so the second way um, uh, the ruling class control our values is uh, through the repressive state apparatus or the use of threat and coercive control. And this is what happens when socialisation fails and groups that actually present a threat to social order um, uh, maybe start protesting or what have you. Uh, and then they start using the formal agents of social control. So things like the police and uh, the army abroad. They don't deploy the army generally at home, but they do use a, a type of army in America against their own citizens. So can you think of any examples when the ruling class has felt that, they ha that you know, the ideological control has failed and they've actually had to use, use force and, or threat to try and get things back in order? Um, just going forward, um, because of the, the, this manipulation of values, uh, it means that the law is applied unevenly and no one tends to question why this might be. So can you answer these three questions? Which groups are most likely to be arrested and once they are arrested are far more likely to be convicted? And that actual conviction statistic can be linked to things like lawyers and how much they might cost, by the way. Um, and what impact does this have on statistics on crime? Um, and if you keep on getting the same groups being arrested and the same ones being convicted, therefore they're showing up in the statistics, then what perception of crime and deviance does this therefore reinforce? Okay. Now, you've got to remember that throughout all of this, um, these statistics are feeding into our socialisation process through things like the media. Um, so because we're socialised into believing via the media uh, that actually most criminals are working class and, and, and the media, the police feed into that. So what impact does this have on policing? Well, the final result of this process is that explanations of crime, like that the fact is that they are based on the common characteristics of criminals. Um, so everyone starts from the assumption that crime is a working class problem, which basically means we have much more biased policing. Um, and this, can you think of an example of actually how biased policing can have a very negative effect on the working class community and actually maybe could feed in to the idea that working class people are more likely to be criminals? So how could the policing's approach, sorry, the police force's approach to policing actually reinforce this perception that working class people are criminal? Uh, what's not often referred to is actually we're also manipulated to an extent about who we actually perceive to be the most likely victims of crime. So there are certain groups in society who are far more likely to be the victims of crime. Um, and when I say um, who are these people, I'm going to show you a couple of graphs in a second. You can actually identify who these people are. But who is actually more protected, aka prevented, from becoming victims of crime? Well... The, if you think about it, um, the middle classes, okay, they're the ones who have the private property, they're the ones who fear for their private property and themselves, so as a result they invest more in security measures, um, uh, they are, they've got more, uh, if you like, clout with the police force, so their neighbourhoods tend to be monitored more closely, um, and as a result they generally are more insulated from being victims of crime. You know, to make it even worse, they're more likely to have insurance, like home insurance and car insurance. So if they do happen to become victims, their goods get replaced. So when you look at the graphs, which are just ahead in this lecture, and you can flip forward and back if you want to now, can you please identify which groups are hit by what I'd call a triple negative? They're negatively labelled as criminals because of statistics, they're treated differently by the police because of this. They're far more likely to be victimised by crime according to the graphs on the next couple of slides. And because of the way the police treats this group, they're far less likely to go to the police because they actually trust them. Uh, and even if they do go to the police, they're far less likely to have a sense of protection from the police, and the police are far less likely to maybe take their concerns seriously. 
So this is about um, the age of people who are victims of crime. So which age range generally feels more fearful of crime? Um, but actually, when you look at this graph, it's actually clearly it's the younger people who are more likely to be victims of crime, which is the opposite of the perception of who's more likely to be a victim. And here we've got um, sort of victimisation by male to female. Um, so obviously between males and females, who's more scared of crime? Um, it's actually women, but actually males are more likely. Again, who's more likely to be a victim of crime, white or black? Well, it says here black people, but again, white people seem to be more, more fearful. Here we've got age, plus 65 versus sort of 16 to 19. Well, 16 to 19 are far more likely to be victims of crime, but they don't tend to feel scared, whereas the, the elderly do. Uh, here we've got something on income. Okay, so people who learn less than $7,500 in the United States, they are far more likely, that's a year by the way, they are far more likely to be victims of crime than those who are earning more than $75,000 um, a year. Um, again, this is for the United States, but the sort of same patterns apply for the UK. And there we've got the difference between rural and urban sort of criminality as well. Much more likely in urban areas, more likely to be socially deprived. So if you could annotate onto your, to your slide on victimisation, just to kind of reinforce the idea that our values are always being manipulated as to who is more likely to be a victim. And it just sort of reinforces the idea that, you know, the middle class elderly woman is far more likely to be a victim of crime than the sort of uh, working class black male. But actually it's the reverse, it seems to be true in this case. So this is um, a classic example, I would say, of manipulation of values. Um, here we are. Councils are to be given powers to ban peaceful protests that might disturb local residents. And I don't know if you remember uh, the, uh, the protest against um, capitalism. This was from the Occupy London movement. Um, at, in reaction to that Occupy London movement when protesters against capitalism ended up camping outside St Paul's. You can Google this and find out a bit more about it. Um, soon after, councils were then given the powers to actually ban these type of protests, even though they were peaceful. Um, and you've got to think, how is that going to manipulate people's values? You know, how is that going to stop people's having their mind changed about the real problems in our society because remember it's all about ideological control we all the ruling class wants us to believe that capitalism is good and fair and they don't really want us hearing these sorts of messages so the second sort of strand of this um, lecture is looking at for traditional Marxism is looking at actually bias law creation. So Marxists argue that the laws reflect ruling class interests. And that's not a surprise because remember the state is a tool of the ruling class. It's not the ruling class, although many people who are very wealthy do work for our state. Um, the state is a tool of the ruling class. Um, so can you think of any examples of laws that benefit the ruling class? Um, so they do this by setting the agenda about what the types of laws need to be passed and through making sure that values are sympathetic to the ruling class and that's kind of integral throughout our judicial system as well. Now William Shambliss, who's a traditional capitalist, here's, here's a quote that might help support this argument. The heart of the capitalist state is the protection of private property. So he basically means that the state passes laws that protect private property or the economy, not people. So can you have a look at the following examples and can you annotate on your PowerPoint how they illustrate his view that the laws are generally created to benefit the rich, predominantly to protect their wealth and their status over perhaps human people's cost. So here we've got a headline about a bank robber who was jailed for 13 and a half years for blowing up three cash points. So, you know, uh, attack on material wealth. And what I'd like you to do is contrast this with the centre that a British soldier got for raping a six-year-old girl, just nine years. Um, this um, is a headline, uh, I think it's from The Guardian or The Independent. Um, who's to blame for the crisis, bankers or benefit claimants? And it's identifying that uh, the current policies of our government have very much been about slashing welfare payments and sort of seeming to blame this recession on... It, too much spending on welfare where actually this recession's been caused by ridiculous behaviour in our banking sector where, and they've all kind of got off scot-free uh, and the taxes on banks are still ridiculously low but people who um, you know, maybe have an extra bedroom in their council house are being charged extra for it and these are people who are the poorest in our society and perhaps need, need a bit more support. Uh, yeah, this is just a typical protest actually challenging this sort of austerity. And although it does come from Dublin, um, these sort of messages 
are definitely are conducive to uh, the people's reaction against this austerity policy. And this is a very recent one. Um, you know, the government's recently passed a, a bill through the House of Commons in favour of um, uh, tightening uh, restrictions on, on calling strikes. So you can read through that information there. Think about whose interests that benefits preventing workers from striking, particularly this idea that they can use temporary workers while people are on strike, which kind of undermines the effectiveness of a strike anyway, if they can just employ temporary workers to cover the work they do. A second way uh, the ruling class can effectively manipulate a law creation is through pressure group activity. Now, um, there are plenty of pressure groups in our society, and their main role is to try and put pressure on government and policy making. Um, and there are two different types of pressure groups. There are insider pressure groups and outsider. So there I've given you a list of some examples of insider pressure groups. Uh, Confederation of British Industry, British Medical Association, National Farmers Union. Generally, insider groups are invited by government to help draw up new policies. So, for example, on the new strike legislation, uh, the CBI, the Confederation of British Industry, was consulted on what sort of legislation they would like to be introduced, and they did make suggestions. And unsurprisingly, the CBI welcomed proposed reforms to strike laws. Whereas outsider pressure groups, uh, they do not get invited to help with policy, and they actually have to try and impact the government through things like um, social media, through media uh, reporting on their protests, and trying to shift public opinion. And one of the most famous ones I've been looking at recently is UK Uncut, which some of you might have come across, and here's a, an image of them protesting outside Starbucks, where they're basically getting very frustrated with the lack of, um, for these sort of huge companies, um, avoiding paying a decent amount of tax. You've also got Fathers for Justice there and CND, the Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament. Um, so which of those two do you think has the most influence over law creation? And which of those two do you think represents the interests of the ruling class and possibly the proletariat? What do you think? So when we think about all unfair law creation, there are a few um, sociologists that you need to be able to um, refer to. So the first one is Frank Pierce. Um, uh, he said, and this is quite a, a, a nice kind of summar summary, I think, um, of his view on law creation. He said, in Crimes of the Powerful, that laws which appear to benefit everyone, in reality, only benefit the ruling class. And the example he referred to was health and safety laws, and also the NHS. So can you please tell me, how do you think health and safety laws really benefits the ruling class? And how do you think the NHS really benefits the ruling class? He also refers to this process called dumping. So he wrote about the United States, and he said, when the United States government forces a dangerous drug or pesticide um, off the domestic market because it's been deemed too dangerous for American people, um, the manufacturer of said pesticide actually then sells exactly the same product to developing countries, normally with the direct support of the United States government. So yeah, they won't sell this dangerous product to their own people, but they'll let an American company sell it to the third world so those people can be exposed to the risks. Uh, and finally, at the bottom there, you've got a quote from Shambliss again. He actually said that um, governments often engage in smuggling both arms and drugs assassination conspiracies, terrorist acts, and other crimes in order to further their foreign policy objectives. And here he's really getting at some of the behavior passive possibly of the CIA, particularly around the 1960s and 70s, the Cuban Missile Crisis and the Cold War, when they were, they were involved in arms smuggling. You know, it's quite famous that the CIA trained up um, Osama bin Laden and al-Qaeda. They, they gave them the weapons because they wanted Osama bin Laden to destabilize the Taliban in Afghanistan. They trained him and his men. So, you know, this kind of idea of terrorist acts, quite often I've had state backing from people like the CIA. We've just had Osama bin Laden has just been assassinated, so we've had state-backed assassination. Um, so it seems that there seems to be one rule for um, the, 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 sort of the privilege in the state and the rich, and maybe another rule for, for the other. Um, the third strand we're going to look at is law, unfair law enforcement. Now, just having a quick look at the gentleman in the top right corner, he's a stereotypical judge, if you like, or magistrate. And what you might notice about him, he, he, he's, he's older, he's, he's white, um, I'm going to go with, he's probably middle class. So as a result, you kind of got to draw some assumptions about the fact that these are the people that are enforcing the laws and sentencing people around the world. And could they be biased against the working class and other ethnic minorities? Probably, if you're a Marxist, you would think that. 
So um, Marxists argue that certain types of crimes are likely to be de dealt with rigorously while others are ignored. So when we think of examples of these sorts of crimes, so street crime, definitely rigorously, whereas white collar crime, pretty much ignored. Uh, and certain crimes are less likely to be reported to the police, don't forget. Again, white collar crime, pretty much invisible. Um, and certain groups are far more likely to be on the receiving end of law enforcement in a targeted way by the police and dealt with in a confrontational way. So can you please annotate on your PowerPoint, how might the police's confrontational style lead to crime? So think about how police um, effectively might go into a working class neighborhood and try and get someone for questioning. How might they do that in a confrontational style? And then maybe contrast it with the police maybe going to a middle class detached house and asking someone to come in for questioning. How do you think they deal with that working class person and that working class person's family um, that might be different maybe to the middle class person and, and, and maybe their family? Um, and, and if they are being confrontational, how can that lead to actually further criminality? Uh, and can you think about what differences there might be? So here's an example of unexpected law enforcement. You might remember this from your taste today. Um, you've got the famous case of Gary Barlow, who didn't pay three million pounds worth of tax. Um, he wasn't punished. He was just asked to pay back the stolen, in inverted commas, money. Didn't get any jail crime and time and didn't get a criminal record. Whereas Nicholas Robinson, who happened to steal a bottle of water uh, from a supermarket during the, the riots uh, in 2012, he went to jail for six months. So if you can't think of any other examples of unfair law enforcement, this would probably be one that I'd refer to maybe in an exam paper. So why do we ignore white-collar crime? Okay, now official statistics tell us that most crime is working class and white-collar crime is underrepresented, uh, thus misleading. So why is it underrepresented? Well, here you've got seven reasons that you might want to note down, and I'm sure you know this anyway. Very difficult to detect, pretty much invisible. A victimless crime, you know, Gary Barlow wasn't paying his taxes, I wasn't running around going, oh God, I'm missing all that money, because it's a diffusion of victimization. Uh, crime actually may benefit everyone involved, particularly if it's bribery or corruption within an, in an organization, like maybe even the victim won't want to report it to the, the police because they're being bribed for something they're quite embarrassed about possibly, or if, they, if it's revealed that maybe they took a, took a, a loan or a, um, a payment for a particular product, they might not want that getting into the public domain. Very difficult to investigate, think about where corporate crime takes place, um, how do you gain access to that place? A lack of awareness linked to the victimless crime. Institutional protection. So, for example, banks quite often won't want the police knowing that there's crime taking place within their banks in case they lose a reputation of being a place to invest money and leave money. So they won't actually want anyone knowing about it. Plus, there's a lack of convictions linked to how complex the crimes are. Middle-class offenders can afford good lawyers. So they tend to get off slightly easier, possibly, than working class offenders who maybe only have to deal with a public attorney that the state pays for. So the law is not being enforced against white collar criminals, and this just reinforces the perception that most crime is a working class offence. So here's a, quite an, a, an example we're going to use quite a lot in class. I'm not going to spend too much time in it right now. Uh, this is a great example of unequal law enforcement. The Bhopal gas explosion in 1984. So if you want to Google that to find out a bit more about it, that would be fantastic. Um, this is a picture of the plant on the right-hand side, and here are some of the people um, who really suffered because of a gas explosion um, that actually led to a cloud of lethal gas floating over to the surrounding slums where all the workers and their families uh, lived and it's led to the immediate deaths of thousands to ten to thousands of Bhopal residents and people are still dying from it today and that was what 31 years ago 32 years ago um, they woke up with burning eyes sore throats and a shortage of breath um, many died in their sleep we've had babies still being born with deformities uh, and when you look at how this um, plant dealt with this gas leak, they tried to blame a, a negligent worker. Um, they got the, the case heard in an Indian court before it was eventually pulled into an American court, so the fine was hardly anything. Um, no one ever went to jail. The company's still running, despite the fact that now hundreds of thousands of people have died because they actually, well, I'll tell you about it in class, um, they turned off the coolant system for this particular gas cylinder in order to save something like $50 a day. So 
it's a pretty horrendous example of unequal law enforcement when a company can get away with that many deaths when someone goes to jail for six months for stealing a bottle of water. I know those cases were tried in different countries, but still. So looking at unequal law enforcement research, here's uh, Lauren or Laureen Satsnyder. Um, she argues that actually, she did a bit of research and she found that losses from corporate crime cost about 20 times more than street crime every year. Yet the chances of prosecution and penalties are ridiculously small. David Gordon, who we've come across before in Crimogenic Capitalism, he argued that selective enforcement serves capitalism in a number of ways. Because imprisonment neutralises any opposition, so people who are protesting, rebelling against the system, committing crimes against the rich, because maybe they disagree in principle with the idea of the rich being rich, it neutralises opposition, it gets them out of circulation. But also, because of the media's way they treat criminals by defining them like with animalistic like um, qualities, it allows us to feel quite justly angry with them, and it justifies the ruling class kind of dishing out these quite extreme sentences. Uh, so here we have a headline from the London riots. Feral rats looted my business. You know, these weren't young people who were disengaged and isolated from society, just being told they had to pay massive tuition fees and have their benefits cut. No, these were feral rats who were looting the business, and that's the headline that we got. Um, got another quote here from... Um, um, well, not a quote, but um, a, a, an extraction from William Shambliss on the take. Now, he studied crime in Seattle, and he argued that power is the key factor. He said that the courts and the jails are filled with the poor and the powerless, while organised crime is operated by the economic and political elite. And that's got to be one of my favourite quotes from his work. So what do you think he meant by that? You know, the courts and jails filled with the poor and the powerless, and it, while organised crime is operated by the economic and political elite. So he's not talking about the mafia necessarily here. He's talking about the economic and political elite. These are the people who appear to be legit, if you see what I mean. So finally, we'll have a quick look at individual motivation. And there's, this is where cap, uh, sorry, Marxists argue that the cause of individuals committing crime actually lies in the nature of capitalist society, with its emphasis on competition and the acquisition of wealth, and the inability of some groups to achieve these goals. Um, that lead, this is what leads them to crime. So straight away, we've heard goals mentioned there. So what other theory is this very similar to? Okay. Um, so the argument is we get these values through agents of socialization. Again, it's the education system, this real drive towards individual economic success, you know, being in competition with each other, uh, respect hierarchy, try and clamber up it, be in conflict, work hard, get your financial reward. Um, <clears throat> so we're socialized into these sorts of values. Um, and if you think about it, these are Gordon's crimogenic values. So can you use these values to explain white collar crime? See if you can extend yourself. So finally, here are some statements from a traditional Marxist, if you like, on crime and deviance. And what I'd like you to do is try and criticize each of them with evidence if possible. So crime occurs because of the unequal structure of the capitalist society that creates relative deprivation. If we had an equal society, crime would disappear. Can you think of any evidence to refute that? Next one. Capitalist countries always put profits ahead of laws, uh, such as increases in the minimum wage and health and, uh, and safety. Is that true? Number three. Because of relative deprivation, the poor feel a strain and are more likely to commit crimes for material gains, such as robbery or burglary, against the wealthy. So is that true? Can you think of any evidence to disagree with that? And finally, therefore, the most likely criminals are those that suffer the most poverty and have few alternative options but crime. So who are the people who suffer the most poverty? Have a think about that. Thank you for listening, Year 13.